everybody, Shai Fleischer here on the road in the United States and always thinking about uh, the Holy Land. Recently, I gave a talk in Texas. And in that talk, it was to non-Jews, to Gentiles, Bible lovers, Christians. And I said to them, what I always say to groups like that, I say, let's agree to agree. There's so many things that we agree on. Let's talk about those things. Let's talk about the Bible that we agree on and not worry so much about the things that we don't agree on. And they really liked that. And then I said to them, let me, let me make a formulation. Let me say something. Let me know if it sounds right to you, if you can accept this formulation. They said, okay. And I said to them, do we not all want to see the restoration of the house of David, the Davidic dynasty to rise again? And they said, absolutely and amen. And I said, you know what? That's a way that I could say it where I'm comfortable as well, the restoration of the house of David. So as I'm driving here uh, in the United States, um, I wanted to actually put out a video that I made recently on a hike with a world expert in King David, and that is my friend Sev Warrenstein from the City of David, an amazing organization, an amazing area in the land of Israel, uh, not very far from the Western Wall and the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And Sev Warrenstein and I were hiking in the Ella Valley, and we were overlooking the area that King David fought with Goliath. And we made a spontaneous video about the story of King David uh, and that famous battle and what that battle is really all about. So I want you to check this out, a very special video that I'm proud of with Zev Warrenstein about the battle of King David and Goliath and what King David is all about. Enjoy. All right, I'm here with my good friend Zev Warrenstein, one of the directors of the City of David. And we're not in the City of David, we're not in Yerushalayim, we're not in Hebron. We're actually in a place called Tel Azekah, over Emek Ha'elah, the Elah Valley. This is where King David fought the famous battle uh, with Goliath, with Goliath, as we say in Hebrew. And this was an amazing battle. Zev, thank you so much for joining me here in this beautiful place. Thanks for joining me here. So, so there's really two ways that we could see the story of King David's battle, this epic battle with Goliath. One way is the classic way that you're going to see in Judaism, in the Jewish religion. You're going to see it that the way the text seems to indicate is that when faced with insurmountable odds, King David courageously did not accept the shields and armors of King Saul. And he went out to meet Goliath in the field and he, and he, and he called out in the name of God. And he says, you come to me with sticks and armor. I come to you in the name of God. And then he fells him, falls him, fells him. He slays him uh, using these rocks that he picks up here from the Elah Valley. So that's like the, the kind of religious way of seeing it, the, the God way. What do you think about that? I think that is a Jewish way of viewing it, but not the Jewish way of viewing it. I think there's another Jewish way or biblical way to view this story. Okay. Uh, and it's very interesting because King David uh, is anointed by the prophet Samuel. Uh, I think it's uh, 1 Samuel 16. And uh, that's it. He is going to be the next king over Israel. Great. And then the next chapter in uh, 1 Samuel 17, Shmuel Aleph, Yud Zion. What happens? The battle against Goliath. And, and what's the... Uh, so he's already anointed? He's anointed. Right. Right? He's the next king. So now Saul is still ruling. And what happens? His father, Yishai, Jesse, says to David, Hey, your brothers are all out in the front lines. Uh, facing off against the Philistines, go bring them some supplies. So that's what David does. He's a good son, listens to his father. And he goes out and what does he see? He sees the camp of Israel led by King Saul on one mountain. You have the Philistines on the other mountain. You got the Ella Valley right in between. And that's where we are right now. We're looking at it right that's now. That's right, right, right over here. And what happens? David sees this giant, Goliath. They say he's nine feet tall, 10 feet tall, huge guy. And a warrior from his youth. Yeah, warrior. A serious man of war. And he comes out and it says for 40 days and 40 nights, Jewish tradition says he would come out specifically in the morning and the nighttime. Why at those times? To taunt Israel? During the times of Kriyashma. Right, the time when the Jewish people are meant to recognize the oneness of God, to say the very famous prayer, the Shema Israel, the hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. At that moment, when the Jewish people are saying that prayer, recognizing the oneness of God, Goliath would come out and taunt the people and say, who's going to fight me? Right. No one would come out. They're afraid. In a certain sense, they're more afraid of Goliath 
than they are of God. Right. And he taunted God as well. He's That's basically right. like, you guys are losers and your God is a loser. Right. Right. Or your God is a loser and you guys are losers. Right. Either way, you're all right. losers. Right. And you know what? He was right. Because no one, for 40 days, 40 nights, no one is willing to come out. David comes along and he, he hears this. And, and just like Moses in the Exodus story, when he leaves the palace and he sees the Egyptian taskmaster beating the Hebrew slave, and it says that Moses, he, he looks around and he sees that there were no people. Now, what does that mean? And one of the things, one of the answers is he can't believe. Here in open daylight, in Egyptian society, the most advanced, enlightened society in the whole world, what, you could just beat a person in the middle of the street and nobody cares? Right. That's right, and Moses acts. David comes along. And he can't believe. How could it be that this, as he calls him, an uncircumcised Philistine, how could he go and mock the name of the living God of Israel? And no one's doing anything. So he starts asking around. He says, well, what happens if uh, someone goes out to fight? And people say, well, the king said, if you go and defeat Goliath, you are going to get to marry his daughter. All right, that's a good prize. Right. Okay, so you get two and one, right? You get you get to defeat this guy who is who's, who's uh, 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 defaming God publicly. You get to s defend Israel, and you get to marry the king's daughter. That right, sounds yeah, good. It's a promotion. Good yeah. deal. And the only problem is you might end up dead. That's true. Right. Uh, it's, it's a big risk, although it seemed like at that point they were going to end up dead anyway, right? right? And, and so what happens? David's like, I'm going to do it. Okay, so so far, everything that we've set up until now fits in with what you said is the Jewish way of looking at it. Because why is he why is he willing? A, a faith way. Right. Why is he willing to do it? Well, God is with him. God, he's the anointed of God. Of course, it's going to work out for him. And yet what? David goes and uh, he's brought before Saul, Shaul HaMelech, King Saul. And Saul, you know, interrogates him. He's like, really? Are you serious? This isn't a joke? He's like, no, I'm willing to right, do you're it. Just, you're just a kid. Right. But he's like, I fought the lion and the bear. I, I could do this. Right. I have experience. I have experience fighting. Okay. And so what happens? They say, bring, bring me, uh, he says, bring him, bring him my, my armor. Saul says right. to his men, bring armor for King David. Now the Bible describes what Saul looks like and describes what David looks like. They are very, not the same. Right. Saul Saul's is big, broad, strong. strong, stocky. David is, is much smaller. And they put the armor on to David. And David says, I, I, I can't, I can't wear this. You gotta, you gotta take this off, right? This is not, this is not for me. Right. Now, why does he say that? Okay, so there's, right. I guess there's there's one way to read it is I don't need this stuff. I'm with God. I'm 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 spiritual. I'm I'm relying on God. I don't need all this extra stuff on. Me. That's one way. Right. Right. What's another way? What does David understand? If the battle comes down to armor, David lost already. Right. If it's going to come down to who's going to strike who stronger and shields and and armor, forget it. He's he's going to get crushed like a bug. What does David understand? He has two advantages that he's going to use in his battle against Goliath which is speed and distance. So what happens? David, he's like, I don't, I don't want the armor because armor's going to slow him down, right? Right. He's already thinking, he says, he says it's, it's true God may be with me and I may believe that I'm doing what God wants of me. But at no point in this whole story does God ever say to David, David, don't worry, I'm with you, you got this, everything's going to work out fine. Right. David has to come up with a real plan. And so he says, I don't want the armor. And as he goes out to meet Goliath, what does he do? So as he bends down, picks up some stones, right? Okay. David is about to become. He's going to bend down, pick right? up a stone. All right. He is about to become the this original. Is a small one. A small one. Yeah, it's much the, bigger. It's bigger stones, like and, baseball sized stones. Yeah. And Malcolm Gladwell says that in his book, uh, David and Goliath, right. that this stone that David's going to, to shoot from his slingshot is going well over a hundred miles an hour. Right. And it's a, if you ever pick one of these things up, it is a, you're like, if I hit somebody in the head with this thing, I'm cracking a head yeah. open. This and, thing is serious. And, Back then, it was a skill. Like right. you could, from a distance, right. you could be a sharpshooter. Right. David is the original Judean sniper. Right. He's like, I'm not getting anywhere near Goliath. I'm not going to be near his sword. I'm not going to be near his javelin. I'm not going to be near his anything. Right. I'm going to stay far, far away. He comes down, picks up the stones, and from a distance, they have the taunting. Goliath is taunting David. And but but David doesn't say to him, "I'm coming to you with superior technology." That's right. He says to him, "I'm coming to you in the name of God." But God, Lord of for hosts. Sure. Everything David does is in the name of God, but he acts as if there's a saying, uh, pray as if everything depends on God. Act as if everything depends on you. Right. And so David understands everything he's doing is in the honor of and the name of God. He, oh, is, he is preventing right. the worst thing that you could have happen from a Jewish perspective is a desecration of God's name. The prophet Ezekiel talks about why does God bring Israel back to the land of Israel? 
He says, not because we were so worthy of it. He says, but for the sake of his great name, that when the Jewish people are oppressed, it's a desecration of God's name. That's right. And therefore, David recognized that there was a chilul Hashem. There was a desecration of God's name that was happening. And so David is acting to sanctify God's name. But still, he's living in a world where there, there are laws of combat, laws of physics and so on. And right. he has to work within those, those, those laws. And not only that, he was actually a, a newer iteration, a newer version. Uh, the single combat type, type war uh, where Goliath seemed to have an advantage was the older version. Slow, uh, mechanized, heavy, armed. This was a, what is, what, there's a term that uh, Malcolm Gladwell uses, like he's a shooter. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's got a, he's got a, a slingshot. He's got like a... Uh, he's a sniper. Right, he's not, he's right, exactly. He's a sniper. He right. stays far away. He takes out Goliath right. from very, very, you know, a distance where Goliath could never reach him. All Goliath does is shout at David. Right. Uh, but that's it. And, and David... He makes no, he, he fires no shots. That's right. He's he, got, he's, there's never contact. Because David takes him right. out well before, uh, now... What happens next? Wait, but b- before we get to next, and I want to get to next, to me, in many ways, both are true. The faith side and the new technology right. side. And, and the, greatest, the greatest proof for me for that way of thinking is modern day Israel, where it has a miraculous side and it has a high tech side. Both are true. When you go totally faith and you don't have tech, well, you're, you're kind of... You know, you're kind of talking in air. But when you're all tech and you're not talking about God, that's also a failure yeah, well, when you're relying on technology too that's much. Right. What, what we see this uh, in the Bible, and I think we see it in, in modern times, uh, the worst thing, the thing that we have to be, we're warned to be careful against, is to believe that in my might and in my glory, that I have this victory. Right. Uh, and we were warned by Moses about that, and I think it's a warning that, it's still important to take to heart right. to this day right. that to not think, well, because we have all of our intelligence and our military and our that, that you know what, you know, we're good. Like we, right. we, we don't we don't uh, we don't need to uh, have any spiritual uh, assistance. Right. Uh, and so the, the model, as you're saying, is is, yes, David has faith. And yes, David uses the technology and he's a warrior. The, the uniqueness of David he puts them together. Right. He gives all the credit for what he does to God. Right. Says, "I'm fighting for God," right. and and yet he goes and in the real world he uses the technology of that world but, and and the and the more advanced technology. That's right. Right. He, he's he's ahead of the curve in terms of technology. So he's using both of those at the same time, and that's what's so important. You know, uh, some people say that one of the failures that Israel had in the Yom Kippur War and maybe in the October seventh attack is too much of a reliance on technology without you know maybe common sense without looking open your eyes. But the bottom line is. You know, we need both of those elements to work for Israel. Israel is a tiny country in this region. Uh, it's an armed ethnic minority. We have a lot of enemies right now surrounding us. So we need God. <laughs> and that's the only way this country is going to survive. But of course, at the same time, Israel's famous for being always up on the latest technology and using it from intelligence to tanks to drones to all these things. We need both of those things operating at the same time. And so, so we, we can't lose track of that. How do you, how do you maintain that balance? I guess, I guess that's the Davidic balance. Right. Now, what's the connection of this place to Jerusalem? All right. What happens? David goes, he kills Goliath. Now, what does he do after he kills Goliath? He takes his head. He chops off his head. He takes Goliath's <laughs> sword. Cuts off his head. Right. Excalibur. What does right? he do with the head? Uh, does he bring it to Jerusalem? So he takes the head, goes out to the Jebusite controlled city that will later become known the city of David, Ir David, and he takes that head and he puts it on a giant spike outside the walls of the city. Now, David. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's two messages here. It's pretty clear to me. So David is not going to conquer Jerusalem for a bunch of years still, probably wow. close to a decade. Wow. So why is David taking the head of Goliath to Jerusalem? What, what, what's the message? And the answer, again, is this combination. On the one hand, if David is going to become king one day, as God told him he would, and if he's going to make Jerusalem his capital, of course God's going to be in it. But David understands he has to work in this world. Why does he take that head and put it outside the walls of the future city of David? Psychological warfare. Right. He's saying, hey, you Jebusites, you know, this is Goliath. That's right. I killed him. I defeated him. You guys are next. Right. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. But I'm coming. Right? He's already planting seeds that he is going to come and conquer the city. When you come to the whole story, 2 Samuel chapter 5, how does David conquer Jerusalem? Again, he has to come up with very 
let's call it human means to conquer, Jer of course God wants to conquer Jerusalem. We know that. And yet at the same time, he has to come up with a real plan. The, the Canaanites who are in the city, they're taunting David. They're like, we could pl put our blind and our lame on the walls of the city and you still won't be able to conquer it. And you know what? They were right, because David does not go over the walls of Jerusalem. He has to come up with some, what I call the original Navy SEALs, right. and some subterranean secret mis mission, right. penetrate the city from, from within. Sayyid Makkah. Yeah, Bidiuk, right. exactly. So David is this balance of, yes, everything for the honor of God. Right. Working, though, without relying on miracles. Right. David, actually, it's, it's kind of surprising. You almost don't see any miracles right. directly associated with David. That's right. And his, the book is... You know, before him, after him, lots of miracles. Right. All of a sudden, David comes, there's no miracles, right. right? And yet David all the time is speaking of his relationship with God. In many ways, this world is a miracle. The technology and the new knowledge, that is a miracle. Using what's around you, being able to, 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 to see that God created this world, and that is the miracle, and to, to actualize that in this world, that is the miracle. In many ways, uh, uh, um, God prefers to stay a little bit anonymous and that you recognize him without him showing up totally. Like overt miracles are, are considered less good. Uh, the best are where, where you use, you know, the regular world, which is already miracle enough, and then say, it was God. It was God who gave me that strength. He gave me that knowledge. He gave me that idea. He gave me that technology. Uh, so that's awesome. All right, so we understand in many ways, uh, you're giving us a sense of the personality of King David, the war that was fought right here in the Elah Valley, uh, the combination of both faith and technology and, and this worldliness. And so came out a name for the Jewish people that we are, we are the sons of David. We go in that path. We try to bring uh, those two things together. And even though we're small, uh, we, uh, we still, because we come with those things together with latest technology and God on our side, uh, so we're able to defeat our enemies. The enemies of Israel today, though, have flipped the narrative, have flipped the script to say that we're actually the Goliath, that we're this big stomping occupation, this big, you know, armed thing, and that the enemies of Israel, they are uh, the David, that this land is theirs, that God is with them, and that we're, uh, you know, we're the, the bad guys and we're the slow, slothful bad guys. How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you bring back David to, to, the, to the inheritance of Israel? I think it's, it's very simple, which is, it's not that the comparison is Goliath is big and David is small. And so now we're being portrayed as, as the big Goliath and our enemies are being portrayed as David. They're being portrayed as David because they act like David. Mm -hmm. they, they have made their cause one of righteousness and justice, even though it's not righteous and it's unjust. But the way they present themselves to the world is, if you want to stand on the side of justice, well, of course you have to be on the side of our enemies. And we have made ourselves out to be like, well, we're the, we're the enlightened, we're the Western, we're the... And we've stopped talking like David. And I think part of the answer is, if you want to be viewed as David... Act like a David. Right. Right. Don't forget this model that we spoke about of we're the, we are the Jewish people, right? And we have a mission. And we, we, we come from this land where we've been for thousands of years with a heritage that has shaped the world. Every civilization in the world has been shaped by the events that have played out here, literally, uh, from Jerusalem, from the land of Israel, from Judea and Samaria, and embrace that. That's our gift to the world. That's our identity. And if we don't embrace that identity, well, then who are we? We're, we're just another bunch of people that, that at some point will just disappear from, from history. Or we could connect ourselves to our ancestors, to our mission, which has been 3,000 plus years in the making, and saying, yes, this is who we are. We are the descendants of David, and we're still fighting the same enemies that he fought, not literally, but spiritually, same idea, right. same type of enemies, and that we are fighting for the honor of God, and for the honor of our people, and for the honor of our land. Ha. I, if we could, if we could hear uh, Israeli leaders talk like that, but we don't hear them talking, and that's why, and that's what you're saying. That right now we have this uh, this loss of narrative, loss of identity. There, there's someone we we both uh, uh, have spoken of, uh, a guy named Donald Miller, an author, very famous author from from Tennessee, and he has a saying, which I believe is very true here: when you confuse, you lose. You lose. That's right. And we're confusing the world. In 1967 when the Jewish people returned to all the places of our homeland, our enemies surrendered before us. They're right. like, here, take the keys to, to, to Jerusalem, to the Temple Mount, to Hebron, to everything. Here it is, to the tomb of the, the patriarchs and matriarchs. Here it is. And then when we said to them, 
no, 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 like, we're, we're, no, here, like, we, you know, you could have it back. And they said, oh, like, we're, we're sorry. We mistook you for the Jews. We, right. we thought you were the Jewish people. We thought that, you know, all those prophecies that the Bible spoke about, like, were, were being fulfilled. You look like the Jews. We even talk like them a little bit. You sound like them. But clearly, we're mistaken, and we're really sorry. So we're just now going to take all of our, our all of our stuff back because we were giving it to the Jews. And, and so that's who we are. And either we're going to be those people, or we're not. And when we're not, when you confuse, when the world looks at us and says, well, well, you look like the Jews, but you don't act like the Jews. You don't actually talk about your right to this land. You talk about things like the Holocaust. You talk about things like United Nations and what, and you don't talk about the justice of your cause. Not just in modern times, but our connection going back thousands of years, our roots in this land. City of David is also very famous for uh, the archaeology that you find that connects you, which, which corroborates the story of the Bible. Uh, but I want to take that to really uh, three small points. You, you laid out a big vision for, for reaching back into history, talking about our narrative. I just want to make three very small points, which is one, the Bible itself is not so much of a player anymore because through modernity and maybe the enemies of Israel, the Bible has been erased as a player. And and just one simple thing we have to do, and I always tell this to groups, is you got to teach the Bible. You got to learn the Bible, especially the book of Genesis, definitely the book of Samuel as well. But but you got to read these things and make them part of your life. And that's a big problem is that is that a lot of the interlocutors that you have out there, young people on social media, they're not there. And so that whole like... That whole uh, uh, footing for the Jewish people is is gone. That's a problem. We've got to bring the Bible back. Number two uh, is that um, Israel does have to remind people, even though I agree totally with what you said, totally, uh, but we do have to remind people that we are the small country around here. And sometimes when it's painted that our enemies are the smaller thing, they forget the big picture. We have to remind people oftentimes that 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 Israel is still the small country in this region, and it does have our enemies, enemies surrounding it. So it's important to sometimes take out the map. And when I was on uh, Pierce Morgan, I took out the map and I think it had a, a certain impact. And number three is uh, uh, a lot of times, you, most of the time, you don't ever hear Israel talking about that this is the third commonwealth. You hear that Israel was born in 1948. Well, if it was born in 1948, then it's a Johnny come lately thing. But if you say, listen, this is our third commonwealth, starting with King David, who was you know, the first king of a united commonwealth. Uh, is that right? Do you agree with that phrase? Uh, okay, so 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 we gotta we gotta. That's a piece of narrative that has been lost. So basically, the Bible has been lost. We gotta bring that back. The smallness of Israel, that reality that Israel is a small country, this region that it has to you know be tough, is number two. And number three, to say that it's the third Commonwealth that we're an ancient people back in this land. And to, I would write third Commonwealth on the flag, like this is our third Commonwealth. That's that's who we are. We're not here for the first time. I'll add a fourth, which uh, we see from David. He thinks big, mm -hmm. right? He's like, I'm going to unite the tribes. Right in the beginning, it's like, just he's king over his tribe. Right, Judah. He was from the tribe of Judah. And then, and then the other tribes come like, well, we want you to be king over all of us. He's like, great. And you know what? I'm going to unite the tribes. I'm going to have a capital. I'm going to lay the infrastructure for a future temple. David is always thinking, how do I move the nation forward? Mm -hmm. And not just be... You know, okay, how do we have our little, like, refuge state here and, and just, you know, combat anti-Semitism? What's our vision for the world? Right. How are we making the world better? And we could do it, we do it through technology and things like that, drip irrigation and, and all the technology that's used around the world. But, but also, there's, there's other ways that we could make the world better. I think, uh, in many ways, you look around the world, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to, to values, when it comes to identity, which the Jewish people are uniquely suited to contribute to. Uh, and we have yet to step into our position of being a light unto the nations, not just technologically speaking, but perhaps you could say from a values perspective as well. And I think King David was, was one who understood the fusion yeah. of values, the faith in God and, the, and technology and modernity. And that the state is essentially the launching pad to bring all that to the world. Well, Zev Warnstein from City of David and myself, Ishai Fleischer, uh, are here in one of the regions of the tribe of Judah in Tel Azekah, overlooking the Valley of Elah, remembering King David and seeking inspiration for ourselves, 
for the state of Israel, for the Jewish people, and really, as Zeb said, a light onto the world. And I hope that you feel that as well. May King David continue uh, to reign. Um, uh, we say, Am Yisrael Chai, we say, David Melch Yisrael Chai V'Kayam. The King, David, King of Israel, is alive, and, and, his, and his energy continues to permeate into, the, into this world. God bless you folks, wherever you are. David, <laughs> David that's right. <laughs> We're from the city of David. We're in the place of David. But Zev Warnstein and Yishai Fleischer are blessing you. Stay tuned to this channel. Lots of love and lots of blessings. And shalom. Shalom. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, Zev Warnstein and myself overlooking the Valley of Elah and thinking about King David and that famous battle that set him on his amazing career that still reverberates today. And uh, here I am driving in the United States with my family. And wherever I'm driving, I'm driving to Jerusalem. I'm driving to the land of Israel, as I'm sure you are as well. God bless you wherever you are. Subscribe to our channel. It's easy. Lots more great content is on the way. Bezrat Hashem with the help of God. Shalom.